In this lecture, we're going to talk about one of my, my pet peeves, and that's fitting of michaelis menten data. Okay, if you want to determine what the, what the rate of the reaction is and what the, the Michaelis constant Km of a michaelis menten equation is, and this applies to any enzymatic reaction, we can extrapolate this to other enzymatic reactions. We can extrapolate this to, uh, and we do this in the textbook so you can see how this, this occurs. But I want to show you with a concrete example here of why we really need to use more modern techniques and what's been available for, for fitting enzymatic uh, rate constants. So Michaelis, went, Menten, uh, Michaelis and Menten won the Nobel Prize for their 1913 paper describing enzyme kinetics. I'm not going to go through the derivation of that. You can find that in the textbook if you want, um, along with the 1913 reference, or at least a translation of it. The, but in, in uh, basic steps, we, form a, we rapidly form an enzyme substrate complex, which reaches a quick steady state concentration or pseudo steady state concentration. And you, the substrate is converted into product. We have two parameters that describe this. The first is Vmax, the maximum velocity of the reaction, which is really the rate constant times the concentration of enzyme. Um, presume if you know the, con the actual concentration of active enzyme, you can, you can back out K, the intrinsic rate constant for the reaction, knowing Vmax. Generally, we fit Vmax because we don't normally know the actual enzyme concentration. And then there's a second parameter, Km. And Km is there because it allows us to, to define a change in the rate of reaction. Where Cs is very large, we're limited by the amount of enzyme that is present. So we've saturated all the enzyme with substrate, and it can only convert as fast as we have enzyme. So we're, we're effectively running at the maximum rate that it could run at because CS is very much greater than KM. That means CS dominates in the denominator. That cancels out CS and the, the concentration of substrate in the numerator. And we have Vmax, a constant. Now, where Km dominates, and it is larger, it, it's the, you can think of Km as the concentration at which substrate has a difficult time or starts to have a difficult time binding to enzyme. So we're now not enzyme limited, we're now substrate limited in the reaction. And where that happens, v, we have Vmax over Km, so the, the forward rate of the reaction drops, but it also depends on the amount of substrate or the concentration of the substrate that's in the reaction. All right, now michaelis menten described the rate of change in substrate or product concentration as a function of this enzyme kinetic expression. But we don't deal with rates when we're looking at kinetic data. We deal with actual concentrations. And ultimately, we want to know what's happening as a, what's, what the change in concentration is over time. Time is the true independent variable here. The dependent variable is concentration. So if Vmax, assuming Vmax and Km are constants, they're pretty much constant as long as you're not, your enzyme isn't degrading too quickly. So if Vmax and Km are constants, you can integrate this expression, or at least the expression relative to the rate of change uh, in the substrate concentration with time. You can integrate that over time. And we end up with this equation here, which is nonlinear, and, it's, and we cannot get the concentration of substrate as an explicit function of time. And the issue we run into is we have this logarithmic term here. So we can't just solve for Cs equals some complex function of time. Now that 
that problem eliminates a lot of standard curve fitting algorithms. Okay, and that created a problem in terms of being able to fit the parameters Vmax and Km in the proper measurement domain that we're measuring our experimental results with. All right, now it's true we can rearrange this expression. It turns out that it's a, it's a well-formed expression. So we can solve for if, if CS is very much or is greater than KM, we can use this form of the equation to set up an iterative solution. Okay, so we can guess a CS, use that CS to calculate CS. And in a spreadsheet, we can set that up so that it iterates until it converges to a constant. Now, the problem is where if CS is less than KM, then we have to do use a different form of this iterative solution. And this form works in that case. So it's fairly easy to set up it within a spreadsheet this kind of iterative solution where we once we know Vmax and we know Km we can set it up so that at a given time we can predict what the concentration will be. If we didn't have the the ability to do an iterative solution then we would have to essentially guess a CS predict a time okay it's kind of working backwards we guess CS predict time if that's not the time point we're interested in we'd have to guess another CS to predict another time okay so we can set it up in iterative solutions but we have to distinguish between CS greater than KM and CS less than KM this is fairly easy to set up in a spreadsheet there's an example spreadsheet accompanying this where you can see how this is set up all right, so how do we go about fitting Vmax and Km if we don't have an explicit function of concentration as a function of time? And the solution, there are two solutions that have been worked out for this, and they both involve linearizing the michaelis menten equation. So we define a, we, we take this derivative, this pesky derivative, and we just call that the velocity of the reaction, V. And Line, Line Weaver and Burke in 1934 proposed that if you take the reciprocal of the Michaelis-Menten equation, that's this equation right here, where we let dCS dt be velocity. Okay, so if we take this form of the equation, that we can take the reciprocal of that and we get 1 over the velocity is equal to 1 over Vmax. That's a constant. Remember, we've said Vmax is going to be constant. Plus Km over Vmax. Again, both of these are constants, so this ratio is a constant. Times 1 over the concentration. So if we plotted, and, and 1 over Vm is the point, we can calculate that from point to point changes in our kinetic data. So if we have, if we're taking a concentration, say every five minutes, then we have delta T is equal to five. We divide that by the concentration change over that five minute period. And so we have five minutes divided by whatever the concentration change is. And that gives us the velocity of the, the one over the velocity of the reaction. Now we can plot 1 over the velocity versus the, con the average concentration over that time interval that we're making that measurement. Okay, And if we do that, then what we have is a line. This, think of this as y equals a plus bx. So if we plot 1 over v versus 1 over, C, 1 over the concentration, then we can get the intercept A or the slope B from a linear curve fit. Okay, that's, that's easy to do. We can draw a line, calculate the slope, and look at where the intercept is. That's standard linear curve fitting software that, that packaged in almost every 
uh, 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 plotting routine that's available now on the web. Okay, or it's available now on most people's computers. All right, so Edie Hofsey had a different approach, okay, and they, they still do the velocity. They rearrange the equation, though. They multiply both sides by Km plus Cs. That's the denominator of the Michaelis-Menten equation. So they multiply both the velocity, they multiply the velocity times that, and they multiply this by that, and that cancels. So they get Vmax times the concentration of substrate is equal to uh, velocity times Km plus Cs. They rearrange that equation. So the velocity of the reaction is equal to the maximum velocity minus Km times the velocity over Cs. Now, here, again, we calculate the velocity the same way. It's the change in concentration over the interval of time over which we're making the measurement. Okay, we, def we use the average concentration over that time interval. So we can plot now the velocity directly as a function of itself divided by concentration. So this is our x variable. This is our y variable. And now you see we have y equals a minus b times x. OK, now the advantage of the Edie Hofsey approach is that we get Vmax and Km directly estimated. We're not getting the reciprocals estimated. So these two linearization approaches are what are historically or have historically been used, but they suffer from a, a number of severe statistical problems. Okay, the first is we measure CS, not with the concentration of substrate. That's what we actually measure. That has an intrinsic error in that measurement. We don't measure velocity. So we're actually propagating errors when we look at time, which is our independent variable, which we theoretically know very precisely, uh, or delta time. When we convert the change in concentration, we may have errors in the concentration at both ends of that interval. And we don't really, you know, we're approximating the, concentra the average concentration over the interval. But since we don't know what domain we're in, we don't know how that affects Vmax when we're, we're first starting the curve fits. So the velocity is kind of the, but there's errors in both the CS that we're using when we plot as our x variable and the velocity that we're inferring from the data that we're getting. So we're just not fitting the, the data in the correct domain. We should be fitting it in the concentration of substrate as our y variable and time as our independent x variable. Now, the error, the, that creates a problem. And the problem is we can't translate errors in the y domain into errors in the fitted parameters. There's no statistical mechanism to really do that. We could try to do it, OK? If you take, take the um, Lime-Weaver-Burke solution, for example, we, get, we, can, we could estimate an error on 1 over v, OK? Or sorry, we can estimate an error in 1 over v max. We can estimate an error in uh, uh, Km over Vmax, but now we've got a problem because we've got the ratio of Km to Vmax. The error in Vmax is reflected in the predicted Km value once you guess Vmax. So you have a propagation of errors problem when you start trying to determine what the statistical error in each parameter is. So we don't really know how good our estimates are of these two parameters. Furthermore, because we're plotting, in both cases, we're plotting velocity or reciprocal velocity versus 1 over s. That's our, that's our uh, independent variable. OK, so we're 
since that's a hyperbolic representation, we're actually overemphasizing the low substrate concentrations in the curve fits, which means we're biasing all our estimates to where substrate is limiting, not enzyme. And that creates a problem for estimating Vmax. All right. So we've talked a little about this. We're fitting 1 over Vmax, not Vmax. Um, there's an error propagation that ends up uh, um, influencing our estimate of Km. Edie Hofsey is a little bit better than Lineweaver line Burke. Uh, Edie Hofsey, there, there we're plotting the um, the problem there is we're plotting the dependent variable against itself because we're plotting v as the y-axis versus v or velocity divided by concentration as the x-axis. Okay, well that you know that's an autocorrelation problem. Even if our concentrations were wildly in error, we're still going to get a concentrate. We're still going to get a correlation because we're plotting v versus v. All right, um, but. The nice thing about Edie Hofsey over Limeweaver Burke is we're actually estimating Vmax and Km directly, and they're independently estimated in the in the equation. Both of these methods, though, even though they're still in most of the biochemistry textbooks today, they're both archaic methods, and they're they're, they're you really don't need to use them. Anytime I see somebody using this, I just want to scream. Okay. You can, with a simple spreadsheet today, you can set up an implicit nonlinear curve fitting method which gives you direct statistical estimation of how good you've estimated your parameters. And that's what we're going to discuss. All right, so how do we do an implicit nonlinear fit? Now, if it was explicit, there's plenty. You could use R. You could use um, most of the plotting programs that are available now, like Kaleidograph or um, to, uh, Sigma Plot. Those kinds of things. They'll happily fit nonlinear curve fitting, and they'll uh, they'll happily do explicit nonlinear curve fitting. And you just have time and concentration data, and they'll happily fit it to any you know nine or ten parameter equation you want to fit it to okay that's that's fine it can ha it could handle an explicit function very easily the problem is we don't have an explicit function so none of those curve fitting routines can be used so now we have to build our own that's that's the problem okay so we want to work from the integrated form of the michaelis menten equation so we use this form of michaelis menten Vmax and Km are in separate terms, but we don't have Cs as an explicit function of time. Now, we've already discussed that we could set up iterative solutions in a spreadsheet. So we make an initial guess for Cs and iterate back and forth with the you know, left-hand side equals the right-hand side iterate until it converges on a constant value, and we can let that converge um, in, a, in a spreadsheet. So that gives us a convenient way to implement all of this. So now all we have to do is define an objective error function based on the fitted parameters, and then iterate over that, those fitted parameters until we minimize the error. Well, that's pretty easy. At each, we can have a concentration measured at every time point. So x of i would be time or a time point ti. Okay, and f of x is the concentration that we measure at that time. And then using the integrated form of the michaelis menten equation or the correct iterative solution for Cs, okay, we know time is a constant. So at that time, with a guess at Km and Vmax, we can predict what Cs should be. The error then is the difference between the actual and the predicted. That's the error. Now, 
in order to do this properly, you really want to square the error so that you're doing a um, minimization of the least squared error. Okay, that's easy to set up. I calculate the error and then I square it. And that way, positives and negatives um, don't cancel out. All right. Now, um, all we're doing is iterating on KM and VMAX. Now, we could extend this to other parameters. There's no problem in doing that. So if you have a kinetic expression that has more than one uh, fitted parameters, like, like we had a competitive inhibitor, okay, or we had a, um, uh, an allosteric regulator that we wanted to fit, or we have a self-toxicity or, you know, a, a self, um, there are times when the concentration gets so high it, it turns the enzyme off. Um, concentration of substrate or concentration of product uh, could, could um, regulate or affect the effectiveness of the enzyme. Okay, we can even allow the concentration of the enzyme to change over time or the active enzyme to change over time. So it's just adding a few more parameters into this and it works. It's, you know, you can, you can do it. It can, it can be expanded to include those kinds of solutions. All right, so we've described what the error function looks like and all we want to do now is minimize the least squared error by varying or allowing the software to vary KM and VMAX. In Microsoft Excel, that would be a routine like Solver, which is built in free in Microsoft Excel. There's an equivalent in the Google uh, spreadsheet program. There's an equivalent to Solver in almost every spreadsheet program that you use. It just automatically iterates on KM and VMAX until it finds the minimum error. Okay, once we have that minimum error, then things become pretty easy to convert that into a statistical error of the estimate. Okay. And the easiest way to do that is you estimate the Jacobian matrix. The Jacobian matrix is how does the, what's the change in the error with respect to each fitted parameter holding the other parameter constant at its at its correct value or its its least squares value. Okay, so we end up with a in the case of Michaelis Metten, we end up with a two by n matrix. So we have one column for KM where P P1 is equal to KM and uh, we have a second column for change in Vmax holding KM constant. Um, and we can do this numerically. It's real easy to, to set this up as a numerical estimate. And that gives us a 2 by n matrix. And we have to do that at every data point. Um, so every time point that we have in the series. So it's n points long. Now, from the Jacobian, if you multiply the Jacobian times its transform, and divide that by the number of data points, we go from, a, from the Jacobian matrix to create a Hessian matrix. The Hessian matrix would be, in the case of michaelis metten would be a 2 by 2 matrix, because when you multiply the a 2 by n matrix by an n by 2 matrix, you end up with a 2 by 2 matrix. So we have, and all we really care about here are the diagonals. So H11 and H22 are the diagonals of that matrix, that 2 by 2 matrix. That's all we really care about. We don't care about the other terms. Um, and now it becomes real easy to estimate the statistical error because in principle we know the variance. We know at these values of KM and Vmax that cause a minimum error. That's the best fit that I can obtain to the data. So I can calculate what the, what the sum of squared errors are. I've already effectively done that in my error function. And that is the variance. Okay, you know, divide by an n somewhere to get the variance because your variance is the average error. Okay, so once I know the variance, I multiply the variance by the appropriate 
diagonal of the Hess Hessian matrix, or they actually divide the variance by the appropriate um, uh, value of the Hessian matrix. So if I'm interested in the, if I'm looking at Km, and I want to know K, I know what the at what the the predicted best value of Km is, but because there's some error in the data. Okay, I can now estimate statistically based on the number of data points and the confidence interval that I want, say 95% confidence, which would be a P of 0 0.02. And two-tailed, because the error could be to either side, okay, I multiply by the student's T value times the square root of the variance divided by the Hessian diagonal corresponding to that parameter. And that gives me the, the uh, if I use 95%, that gives me a 95% confidence interval for the estimate of Km. Now that's, that's critically important because if I know what the confidence interval is, I can now compare two different kinetic runs. And I can see is Km different or is Vmax different. That has implications to whether I'm getting allosteric regulation effects with some third parameter, or I'm getting uh, competitive inhibition. Okay, so these things actually do matter. You know, you need to know those confidence intervals to know if something else is occurring. All right, so I've gone through this pretty quickly. This is described in great detail, um, or much greater detail in the textbook. So again, I encourage you to, to purchase the textbook. But let's see what the effect of this is. Okay, we, you know, it's a lot of work to set up these spreadsheets, um, particularly the first time you're doing it. That's one of the reasons I give you a, an example spreadsheet. This is the example that we're covering in that example spreadsheet. So it's set up. You can look at how I do all these calculations and what the equations are. All of this is easily programmed into an Excel spreadsheet or a Google spreadsheet. Pretty much any spreadsheet can handle all of these matrix manipulations. Um, but let's look at an example. So here's data from, from the, the literature. We're looking at the lactase enzyme. Lactase is an enzyme that's used to make, to convert milk sugar into more readily digestible forms. You have, as a baby, you have lactase in your um, in your stomach and intestines. That enables you to uh, drink cow's milk, to drink your mother's milk without getting colic or without getting sick from that. If you didn't have lactase, you couldn't digest the sugars in milk and they would pass on to your intestine and your bacteria. You go, oh wow, party time. I've got all this sugar around and I'm just going to going to explode these intestines and you get lots of gas if you're lactose intolerant. Most in, in most cultures, lactose intolerance kicks in at some age, usually um, in typically in Asian cultures because they don't have a lot of milk in their diet normally uh, or historically they haven't used a lot of milk in their diet. Um, that kicks in, you know, sometime after you're weaned, probably in your teen years, you can start to get more and more lactose intolerant. Uh, in Western European societies, because milk and dairy has been a part of the the adult's diet throughout history, uh, throughout you know a long enough time in history in Western Europe, and in the, you know to some extent in America, um, America's really kind of too young to to talk about as a homogenous uh, population, but in in Western European cultures, it's typically more your 40s or 50s where lactose intolerance kicks in, and that's where your body just start stops producing lactase enzyme. That's all it is. Um, so we make we manuf we take lactase from. Uh, various sources, uh, microbial sources typically, throw that into milk and we make something called acidophilus milk because it used to be made from an acidophilus organism. And acidophilus milk, the lactose, which is a disaccharide, is broken down into glucose and galactose. And glucose and galactose, everybody can eat. 
Okay, so that's the that's the only issue is your body, everybody's body at some point starts uh, stops producing lactose, which means you get lactose intolerance. And all that means is, yeah, you fart a lot. Um, so you have a lot of intestinal discomfort and you, you have a lot of gas. Um, that's really the only problem with it and people don't like to pass gas in public. All right. So, um, but you can also get more nutritional value out of the, out of the milk um, because you can easily digest glucose and galactose. So here we have a batch kinetic study where we're looking or we've thrown in some lactase into a solution of lactose. Okay, and we start at time zero with point, uh, with two millimolar lactose or I'm sorry, 20 millimolar lactose. And we watch the decline in the lactose concentration over time. And it's supposed to be, since there's an enzyme involved, there should be an enzyme kinetics here, and we want to estimate what is Vmax of the enzyme and what is Km of the enzyme. Okay, that tells us how long we have to process the milk. Um, so if we used, if we implement the Lime Weaver Burke solution, we can estimate a Vmax and a Km, and I've done that, and you can see what looks like a you know a pretty good correlation here. Right? Now, I'd look at that and I'd say my data looks pretty good. But most of the, a lot of the data points, particularly the high concentration data points, are clustered together near the origin. And it's these points out here that are biasing the estimate. Okay, so I can figure out what 1 over Vmax is. I can figure out what Km divided by Vmax is. That's my slope. Okay, and I can convert those by taking the reciprocals, the appropriate reciprocals. And that would be what I predict but I can't really estimate the error of the estimate. Okay, that's because I'm measuring things in the incorrect domain. Now I can do the same thing with E.D. Hoffsey. Okay, and I get yeah, what looks like a somewhat reasonable correlation. The low concentration data looks pretty good. The high concentration, remember this is a reciprocal on 1 over CS. The high concentration data though looks a lot more scattered. Okay, and if you notice I get a different Vmax, and it's different by quite a bit. It's almost seven times, or I'm sorry, 70 times bigger than the Vmax I got from Limeweaver Burke. Hmm, that should raise a red flag. And look at the Km. The Km value here is 464. The Km value here is 0.018. Uh, that's really different. There is something seriously wrong here. So if I had done just one or just the other and happily, merrily gone on my way, okay, I wouldn't have very good kinetic parameters to use for making estimates. Now, let's look at the nonlinear method. So here I've done an implicit nonlinear curve fit. You can go to this spreadsheet, which is available up on the website, and download it, and you can see all how, how I go about doing that. It's an Excel spreadsheet, obviously. So I do an implicit linear uh, nonlinear curve fit. Here's my actual data. So I'm plotting concentration versus, versus time. It's a nice declining curve, okay? I've clearly got data up in the um, enzyme-limited regi regime here, where the rate starts the rate of loss is kind of constant okay and then I'm yeah and then at longer times when the concentration gets low it starts varying more with concentration okay so here I've got kind of what I expected to see so I've got the two regimes so my data covers the the range that I expect to see I'm not high enough in concentration to truly get to a V max and I may not be down at a low enough concentration yet to get to a point where I'm pseudo first order in concentration. Okay, so I'm I'm looking at the at the curve, you know, where it's curving from one one limit where uh, CS is is um, uh, much greater than KM to where CS is less than KM. Okay, but it's not very much less than KM. So that's my numerical optimization solution. 
because I can do, I can estimate the Jacobian and the Hessian and do statistics, I can get my 95% confidence in this. And what I find is I've got about a 10% error in my estimate of Vmax, and I've got a less than 1% error in my estimate of Km. Okay, and if we compare these values to what we saw before, okay, my KM, or I'm sorry, my Vmax value here was 0.0012 reciprocal minutes, and here it was 0.075 reciprocal minutes. Okay, here it's the lower value looks much better. So it's, uh, uh, sorry, I should have should have kept the engineering unit. So this would be 1.2 times 10 to the minus 3. This is 1.5 times 10 to the minus 4 reciprocal minutes. So I actually overestimated Vmax with both Lime Weaver Burke and Edie Hofsey. Hmm. Okay, now my Km value should be 0 0.00162, and I've got that to kind of a 1% error, so it's 0 0.00162, and I compare that to 464 here and 0 0.018 uh, molar here. Well, I was way off on KM. Both of them were estimating values that were way too high. Okay, so now what is that, you know, does that matter? Does that really matter? Well, let's plot it out. Okay, so if I'm doing Lime Weaver Burke and the, taking the Lime Weaver Burke parameters, here is my my best fit from Lime Weaver Burke compared to the real data. It's way off. Okay, well maybe Edie Hofsey was a little bit better. Nope. Completely missed the KM transition. Okay, so here's why we should do it this way. It's, this is very good kinetic data. Okay, it covers the range you want to cover when you're doing enzyme kinetics. The data is nice and consistent. We can fit it with a single, fit it very closely uh, within 10% error of Vmax and, and um, less than 1% error on KM. So we can fit it really, really well using a implicit nonlinear curve fit. We're completely blowing it with Lime Weaver Burke and Edie Hofsey. Those, I wish those would be taken out of textbooks um, because they really are terrible ways to estimate your enzyme kinetics. So again, you can see how all this is implemented on this example with the enzymekinetics.xls, which accompanies this lecture. Just go back to the website and uh, you'll find a link to download that. Um, and at that point, I'll finish this lecture. We have other examples that of, of lectures I've taken out of the book. Um, the book covers a lot more information on enzyme kinetics. There's, there's a huge chapter on enzyme kinetics um, and binding equilibria and all those kinds of things. I encourage you again to buy the textbook. Thank you.